Every year, the World Economic Forum brings together 100 emerging startups with the vision of fostering a global network for cutting edge innovative entrepreneurship. Started two decades ago, the community boasts of an impressive group of alumni, the world's biggest tech companies from Google and Airbnb to Wikipedia and Spotify. Those have all been part of the Pioneers list. Now, joining the coveted tech Pioneers list this year are three Indian startups that are leveraging new technologies to find solutions to old problems, health and climate. Let's start with the first. Giftolexia helps children realize their true potential through early identification of dyslexia. The startup's machine learning based screening solution with eye tracking goggles and IoT enabled smart posters identifies the risk of dyslexia in children within five minutes. Next up, 3D bioprinting, which can bridge the big organ transplant gap, which has some patients on half a decade long waiting lists. That's the belief with which the next big innovation labs was founded. The Deep Tech Life Sciences company says its invention can transform the world of medicine. And finally, Blue Sky Analytics. It aspires to build the world's largest green database with the power of satellite data and artificial intelligence. It hooks all environmental monitors to a unified platform which provides warnings to prevent disasters, both human and economic. Hello and welcome to Young Turks, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. I'm Shireen Bhan. It is my absolute pleasure uh, to welcome on the program today three tech pioneers who represent India as part of the World Economic Forum. Uh, that list that is out today with me are three women founders who are at the cutting edge of technology looking to create solutions for a healthier planet as well as its people. Tina Paul, the CEO and founder of Giftolexia, Abhilasha Purvar, the founder and CEO of X Akmaz, and Pooja Venkatesh, the co-founder of Next Big Innovation Labs. Ladies, thanks very much and congratulations to the three of you. You know, we've been partnering with the World Economic Forum uh, to put the spotlight on tech pioneers for many, many years now. And I can safely say that I don't believe we've had three women founders in the tech space on one program together in a really long time. So this is particularly heartening and congratulations. But Tina, you know, I want to start by talking to you about Giftolexia. Uh, if, I, if I see uh, your journeys, Abhilasha, Pooja and Tina, you're all around the same vintage. Your companies, your startups started about five or six years ago. But Tina, the idea for you to actually start up was a personal one and it was first something that you started toying with way back in 2012. Take me through the startup journey. Um, my youngest son uh, was identified with dysgraphia when he was about 13 years of age. But with the support of uh, like you know, good uh, special educators, he was able to complete uh, his uh, graduation. He graduated from the National Institute of Design. He was even the president of his college. But he was identified too late. 13 is too late to get identified with learning difficulty. So we have brought in a solution that can identify children with learning difficulties as early as seven or eight years of age. So you get four to five years to help the child with intervention programs to go through uh, like you know, class 10, class 12, and then choose the path that they want to do. Mm. So uh, we truly believe that people with uh, dyslexia, as the name suggests, is, dyslexia is a gift, but you need to identify it early and give the children the in right intervention support so they can go on to do, uh, really realize their true potential. Uh, so we have been supported and, by- uh, You know, uh, what a great example Yes, yes. You know, I said, and, and what a great example that you've just shared with us, uh, uh, the way that your son has been able to realize his potential and you're hoping to do that uh, for other children as well. But you know, Tina, you're right in pointing out that the average detection age in India averages between 11 and 12 years. And as you pointed out yourself, that's already too late. Uh, now, yes. I want to understand from you, how have you been able to solve for this? Uh, your tool is a machine learning deep, uh, uh, deep tech based screening tool. Take me through the process of being able to put this together and how you now deploy it at scale. Okay. Um, so when we started five, six years ago as uh, the WSP cohort at NSRCL at IM Bangalore, we were hoping to license the solution from a Swedish firm. But then we realized the licensing costs were uh, very, very high. 
So uh, we like you know partnered with an Indian firm that makes the goggle, and we developed a solution to collect gaze data. So uh, the child wears an eye tracking device and reads a text that's projected either on a TV screen or a smart screen. And this particular gaze data is analyzed using machine learning algorithms. And we come up with a risk, no risk. So like, you know, the uh, intent is to help these students start intervention early on. Uh, and because an assessment is a long drawn out process and it's very costly, we don't have really the infrastructure yeah. to assess all the children. So have a very easy screening where all the children in a class can be screened and we can come up uh, with the result. Um, and like, you know, all of this takes about five to seven minutes per child. So, yeah. So oh, we well, go to in five to seven minutes, uh, that, that can make the difference. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. This can make the difference between a child being able to realize his true potential if in fact diagnosed with dyslexia, which of course is a learning uh, disability, and be able to intervene at the right time with the right uh, tool to, uh, to make a significant change in their ability uh, to move forward in life. But Abhilasha, I'll come back to you, Tina. But Abhilasha, I want to talk to you about Blue Sky Analytics. And you started in about 2018. And the idea really was to try and put data together on dealing with the problem of pollution. Quite literally, that was the starting point. It was a very, very uh, great day in Delhi. And uh, when we looked outside as young founders, the only aspiration at that moment was that in a few years, if we can get blue sky, that'll be like one of the biggest achievement. We start from air pollution, but then extended our innovation to all aspects of climate and environment, to water. Um, and currently as Delhi and pretty much most of North India is reeling from floods, uh, our ability to be able to monitor rivers and uh, lakes and all the water bodies with satellite data and AI is essentially really coming along. And I think the journey for us in the next five years is going to be very uh, sort of exponential and with very high potential for both impact and change. Uh, because it is the most pressing issue that the planet is facing and whatever we are building is of the dire need. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I don't know what the data is telling you, but I'm sure it's uh, uh, it's flashing red on your dashboard because there isn't a city at this point in time in the country that is not inundated with one kind of climate crisis or another. Cities are flooded. Uh, in fact, today, uh, alerts being sounded across uh, the financial capital. And we're seeing uh, how climate change is impacting lives as well as livelihoods. But Abhilasha, you know, you spoke about the opportunity both to make impact as well as for change. Now, explain to me, what is it that you do? So you have access to all of this data. You're providing a platform that brings all of this data together. But what do you do with this and who are you solving for? Who are your clients, for instance? Um, definitely. So uh, the, thing, the problem with the climate data or general climate and environmental data uh, potentially even even till today is that it is not really accounted for in our decision making. If we just take the whole Delhi flood situation, uh, we could have taken um, uh, steps to move people away from the floodplains five, six, seven days ahead of the flooding coming. And we can do these similar things pretty much everywhere. So advanced warnings in the era of climate change is I would say of the utmost importance. And that's where our data and algorithms using satellite and AI, we build these data sets fundamentally. So we measure how much is the water level in a river? What is the probability of wildfire near a forest area? Uh, all those different kinds of probabilities, which with seven to 10 days warning can really save lives. That's the first part. But the second part is I think adaptability uh, is very key. In the next 10 years, many of our decisions, much of our infrastructure will have to be changed. And where do we go? What do we build? How do we build? What is the risk? What is not? All of that needs to be thought and accounted for. And currently, the decision makers fundamentally don't have access to information to be able to incorporate in their day-to-day -day models and day-to-day -day decisions to take uh, this impact. The overall gambit really falls under climate risk analytics, where banks and insurances are really becoming the key actors in taking the driving force and making our planet uh, more adaptable. And I think last but not the most important, uh, but the most important is carbon markets. Uh, we fundamentally have a ability or a potential to mm. be able to stop or in some ways pause climate change or reduce the impact by 
uh, and Indian government in the last budget really put forward a lot of points to uh, make the Indian carbon market like really flourish. So whether it is reforestation, mangroves or yeah. any kinds of projects across the world, uh, there is a huge trust deficit at the moment. Uh, the potential of Southeast Asia, South Asia and African subcontinent in the carbon markets is very thwarted even today because of the lack of the trust between the carbon markets, all the different players. And that is where uh, you know companies like us really come in, where we are able to uh, effectively do a digital MRV. So we are able to look from the satellites and tell yeah. if a carbon project is actually valid, if the carbon credits are true or what the quantification mm. is true. Let me bring Pooja into the conversation as well. Pooja, many thanks for joining us and congratulations to you as well. And I want to start by understanding from you your startup story. You decided to uh, launch the company in 2016 along with your co-founders. What drove you to start up? So um, I think basically, I mean, um, I had taken uh, a break uh, from work uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we then got together uh, to uh, look at how we can explore uh, basically 3D bioprinting across uh, various applications. And the uh, most immediate one was uh, to, uh, you know, look at how 3D bioprinting can be used uh, by clinicians uh, to solve uh, the gap that we are looking at and the abyss that we are looking at between uh, organ donation and organ transplantation. Uh, so we see that the potential for 3D printing, 3D bioprinting as such as a technology is that, uh, you know, the holy grail for it is uh, to develop organs within the lab, which can then be used uh, as a transplant. Uh, as you know, there are a lot of uh, patients out there and uh, uh, the staggering numbers that you see uh, on the uh, organ donor, uh, donor registers are uh, quite large and you know traditionally you see there is a lot of uh, challenges uh, with having to transplant organs in terms of you know uh, the way few donors and second thing is the shelf life as in to transplant them is is uh, you know uh, very critical uh, the the time frame uh, so you know looking at all of this uh, we decided to look at exploring and venturing into 3d bioprinting um, and this was a very niche technology at the point that we started off at so uh, you know we then uh, we call ourselves a uh, uh, deep tech uh, 3D biofabrication uh, uh, company that is working to develop a holistic, you know, biofabrication platform, uh, which then uh, looks at trans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, translating 3D bioprinted yeah. organs from, uh, you know, uh, bench to bedside. So he, we are working on multiple levels. Uh, firstly, we develop our own engineering. That is, uh, we develop our own uh, homegrown 3D bioprinters, which are called uh, 3Bma. And uh, uh, 3Bma is being used by uh, researchers for a wide range of applications, ranging from developing novel biomaterials to developing, you know, um, uh, tissue models, disease models, which can be used as an alternative to animal models. And, uh, you know, it has also been used uh, for uh, developing clean meat. And, uh, of course, the holy grail is to develop 3D bioprinted organs within the lab. You know, I, I, I want to understand from you where you believe we stand in terms of uh, the idea of, of making this a reality. But first, another similarity. I mean, what we heard from Tina, they decided not to go down the licensing route and decided to do this in-house. And pretty much like what we heard there from Tina, you've decided to take the exact same route and do the engineering and the R&D in-house as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, a licensing arrangement or looking out uh, outside. But when can it be a reality? Uh, are we five years away, 10 years away, Pooja? What, what, uh, what can you tell us yeah i think um i mean when we did start off it was very very new and nascent and we were looking at you know the horizon uh trying to understand when this can become a reality but today in the current scenario i can tell you that you know uh fda has come with uh, uh guidelines basically the modernization act uh and also india has come with uh you know a new drug and uh clinical trials rule, uh, which basically sort of uh, mandates and pushes uh, towards using, uh, uh, you know, uh, alternates to uh, animal testing in the drug testing, uh, um, you know, uh, drug testing field. Uh, so we have policies that are coming together uh, 
you know, uh, to start using technologies like ours, you know, bioprinting technologies uh, to develop alternatives uh, to animal models. So that's a good thing. So we have started there. And like I said, we are sort of, you know, trying to get the right stakeholders uh, on board. We are talking to policymakers. We are talking to clinicians. And, uh, you know, we are also uh, uh, bringing in the scientists and the biomaterial uh, experts, as well as, you know, the technology coming, such as us, coming into the fore to actually, you know, uh, uh, develop 3D bioprinted organs uh, that can actually be used for. I really hope that you uh, see a break through and that we see the kind of disruption that you speak of because it is so needed at this point in time as we pointed out at the start of the program there are so many patients around the world uh, you know on waiting lists just waiting hoping that they will be able to catch a break and this could solve for that so we certainly wish you the very best of luck Pooja uh, to you and your team Muthur Finance Bharat ka